Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? You're listening to Riff Worship, the podcast that attempts to answer the age-old question, what makes a riff? Why do we care so much about the riff? I'm one of your hosts, Austin Paulson. With me, as always, is my illustrious co-host. Uh, he's beautiful. He's bald. He's Dylan Adams. Dylan, how are you? Woo! <laughs> Pig suey. Woo! I'm good. Uh, you know, the hogs are doing well. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to make a football reference if, that some people would get if they listened to we're, this. We're like 30 episodes in, or damn near close to it, and if, if uh, people haven't guessed this far in that we have no idea what we're talking about. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. It's we just, just we had enough money to like muster up some mics and some recording equipment. It was a shame. They shouldn't have made it. Uh, you know, John Ford or whoever invented this stuff shouldn't have made it so accessible. They shouldn't as, have gave us money. Yeah, as Dave Chappelle once said, they should have never gave y'all money. <laughs> uh, the third mic you are hearing is our uh, third co-host uh, back again for some more riffs. It's Justin Rutherford Swindle. Definitely his middle name. Uh, looking great. He's got some new glasses. He's looking wonderful. And he's back again to talk about another record. Justin, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Life is peachy. How is how are those antlers treating you? Still good from uh, last week? Yeah, still good. Still haven't <laughs> I haven't gotten shot yet. Uh, fortunately, I live in a, live in the city of Louisville, so you can't shoot guns legally. You can't hunt deer in the middle of a city. It's not deer season. I don't know if that's true or Maybe. not. Maybe that, who knows? That, that is <laughs> that was a that was a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> Wabbit season. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about. Uh, None of Looney these Tunes. things today. We're talking about Looney Tunes <laughs> today. Uh, we're not talking about Louisville. We're not talking about Chicago. We're talking about Cleveland, uh, a place that looks like a Scooby Doo ghost town in its own right. If you've ever been there, uh, it's got the it's got that pyramid, that rock and yep. roll pyramid there. And I it's, hear it rocks. Oh, it, and from, it rolls from. from I, I hear it rocks. I was I was told growing up that Cleveland rocks. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Um, Wow, Drew Carey, it's maybe one true export from that city. Also, Cleveland Hardcore, also pretty good, I hear. Yeah. Um, there's a a quality, there's a there's a certainly an influence in aggressive music that comes from Cleveland. Uh, we can certainly name a few bands, but one of them in particular, your favorite band's favorite band, Ringworm. Uh, I think all of us have gotten the chance to see Ringworm live a few times. Mm -hmm. um awesome band to see perform live they're definitely a live band in my opinion uh they have released some wonderful records including the one we're going to be talking about today their sophomore record birth is pain from 2001 um i want to hear it from you guys how, how do you feel about ringworm what was your introduction to ringworm what what should people know about ringworm swindle what was your introduction to ringworm <laughs> well uh I'm going to do what uh, apparently the human furnace hates. And when I'm talking about ringworm, I'm also going to talk about integrity. Because <laughs> he hates I, that? Uh, I read an interview where he was like, I don't know why people keep up bringing, bringing it up integrity when they're talking about ringworm. We don't even sound anything alike. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, was, I got into uh, the integrity album for those who fear tomorrow. And I still really love that album. Uh, but in listening to Integrity, I was like, oh, what other, you know, Cleveland hardcore out, uh, bands are there? So then I just was like, I'm going to listen to this Ringworm band, whoever they are. And this was the first album I listened to. What were your first thoughts initially? Heavy, very heavy, very fast. Uh, pretty metal for a hardcore record. Pretty hardcore for a metal record. Damn right. I think that's always this band's biggest uh, problem. And they've said it themselves is that we were too metal for the hardcore audience, too hardcore for the metal audience. If you've ever seen this band live, I think what's great is that they are able to kind of 
uh, very easily transition into yeah. different lineups. However, uh, one thing that has always annoyed me is that, you know, maybe the, again, because different audiences, they're into different things. They, right. you know, maybe there's like a breakdown part or something that the metal kids just are not receptive to, or maybe the faster kind of like thrashier, uh, circle pit parts that the hardcore kids just do not give like one <laughs> about. It is so unfortunate because this band is just all, so well-rounded and right so well. Uh, it's, it's so intense. Obviously human furnace ha- is great, great vocalist. This band's got riffs. There's even like kind of solos on this record i it feels very oh, akin to, over it. uh to like slayer like this yeah. record is like kind of has some some slayer worship parts to me there's some death metal on this record too i got into this band way later uh perhaps like maybe around the time of their relapse uh debut uh which would have been hammer of the witch from 2014 i was not familiar Great record i was like slowly kind of inching into hardcore territory and this was awesome. It's fast. It it is like super in your face. Again, vocals uh, by human furnace. It sounds like he is literally just tearing up his vocal cords. Uh, And you'll definitely hear this on this particular record, but that was my first introduction into the band. And then I kind of went back and I I feel like from that, I got to see them live with like, I hate God and Mm -hmm. crowbar and you know, variety. I've seen them on tour with Harm's Way, where, you know, some of the maybe younger hardcore kids were kind yeah. of exposed to this. Um, but uh, Dylan, I'd, I'd be very curious to, because I feel like you and Swindle were kind of the catalyst for picking this record. But where did you find this band? How did you get into this band in particular? I had known about Integrity. I had never listened to Integrity. Uh, I actually knew Ringworm first list uh, by by hearing them uh so they were obviously signed to victory records for quite a few years many albums blah 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 uh when you would buy a victory records release in the early 2000s a sampler would come with it and then sometimes the sampler would also you would also get a sampler as well as a video sampler and i saw the video i believe for justice place revenge which was off their 2005 release of the same title, I believe. And the video shows like, I believe it's a sex worker going through kind of a hotel scenario and having to deal with all the different things there. And I remember hearing that going like, this might be one of the more aggressive things I've heard from this label at that time, because during that time was a weird, this was a weird era for uh, victory records. This was at the height of like, kind of like mall oriented emo uh, kind of some of the second or third wave metalcore bands coming out at that time. Um, but that band always stuck out to me. Uh, I never really did a deep dive of their catalog. I just knew that that the sound of that record was, or that track was really, really intense. Uh, fast forward to about 2011, um, Ringworm ended up on a bill uh, that they weren't supposed to be on. I was going to see the red cord with trap them and Gaza at the exit in. Wow. Um, the red cord was touring their final record, which was, uh, fed through the teeth machine. Um, and ringworm ended up playing or were supposed to play at rocket town. And it's remarkable because, uh, rocket town is a religious cult or was they They were a Christian ran venue. I shouldn't say religious cult. Um, but Ringworm were barred from playing because of their lyrics, and they ended up getting tossed onto that bill. That also happened to be the tenth anniversary tour of the Birth Is Pain album. Ah, there you go. Um, which is phenomenal. They played the whole thing, and I remember sitting in front of, I believe it was stage left guitar amp, and just the guitar tone coming out, knocking my head off. Um, hearing the album, you know, in you know song order. And just getting my head knocked off. And I knew I immediately had to hear that record. Um, and I'm pretty sure I grabbed it off like media fire or something like that. And just compl- just put it on my iPod and was like, all right, this is this might be my favorite hardcore band. And I- I'll say this about uh, Human Furnace's vocals. I think he's one of the more recognizable vocalists in hardcore. Um You can hear him and you know exactly what it is. You know exactly who it is. He sounds like he is just swindle. I've made this joke a lot. He's just mad the entire (laughs) time. And he sounds that way. His voice reflects it. Um, 
You know, I know there are ringworm compare or uh, integrity comparisons to ringworm. Other than being from Cleveland, that's really it. They don't sound a ton alike. There's some members that have been shared throughout the years, but like I always achened integrity as being a little weirder. Maybe more of that, like even their artwork's kind of reflected it. Um, you know, integrity had a little bit more of the kind of like I want to say some goth influences to integrity. Uh, a little bit more of that, whereas like ringworm was. Hey, it's a thrash band. It's old school heavy metal. Uh, there's some death metal influences to it, uh, but it's a little bit more straightforward with Ringworm, I think. That's true. I would say that agree, uh, agreed. Um, you know, just to, maybe we should just kind of get into the backstory of this band a little bit. I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. started in 91. Um, they uh, released their debut album, The Promise, in 93 uh, through Incision Records. And, you know, I think this album is one that kind of gets named a lot uh, when talking about this band. I think a lot of people find it to be, you know, maybe more people in the hardcore kind of world find that record to be more influential. It's fun. It's got some riffs. I wouldn't say it's like their best record by any means. I'm sure they wouldn't consider it. Um, Swindle, you you had some good points about that. We were kind of discussing maybe this band's backstory and some of their previous releases. I mean, have you guys listened to this record much? I don't know if like the the promise really sticks out to you in any particular way. I listened to the first record a few months ago, like not having anything to do with this episode. Mm-hmm. And I'm not normally a person that like picks up on this, but like six or so tracks into the album, it like starts off with just like a a power chord or whatever. It's just like, and I was like, wait a second. That, rem- that happened last song so I like backed it up a song and it starts off with just like a ringing chord and then like I went back a few tracks like four songs on that album just start off with like one ringing power chord and then they like get into whatever and I, like I think at least those songs if not the whole album is like every song is in the same key yeah which hardcore for hardcore <laughs> it's it's like you know at least cool to see where this band kind of started uh you know i i, I want to say the the version i listened to even had like the demo uh mm-hmm. attached to the end which was kind of interesting to hear some of those songs in an even earlier kind of iteration and they're all transitioned with like these symphonic like you know little elements little uh you know little clips um there's even like a kiss live track that they did like a cover of a uh, deuce um but yeah, you know, this is it's a fine record. I I don't really have any big issues with it. It's like there's some interesting vocal layering at times. I don't know. It's not yeah. it's not produced the best for sure. But it's, you know, it's an early it's an early record. It's like what yeah. what more could I have like wanted from this band at this point, I guess is really. Yeah, I read an interview probably with Human Furnace that uh that demo mm-hmm. they tried they like didn't have any money. Uh, so they tried to like in the nineties form crowdfund the demo yeah. to wow. get made. They like put a bunch of ads in like hardcore zines and whatever, and was like, send some money. If you like uh, hardcore and grind, this new band has an album. So send us $4 and you'll get the album. <laughs> and so they hadn't made the album yet. They were trying to get <laughs> yeah. money to make the album. The first person they got money from was someone in Cleveland who ended up auditioning to be their bassist. And he then realized that the album didn't exist yet. He was like, wait, <laughs> I sent you money. Where's my album? And they were like, oh, we uh, bought beer with your $4. <laughs> but he like still ended up being in the band and like, ended up being on the demo i guess that's awesome that is, that's i never a heard great that. story um so the the other thing about this band that i found to be interesting that I, I really wasn't familiar with was that they're from the release of their debut to this record there's like almost like a 10-year gap like yep. they kind of maybe put the band on a little bit of a hold there's some releases throughout the years i mean they did like you know uh leading up to this record, they kind of reformed back in like 99, but Mm -hmm. I guess other things in life were occurring at the time, like human furnace by all accounts, probably wanted to 
focus on his art and his tattooing like he's known for that as well um some of the members of this group ultimately joined integrity for a little while um but kind of reforming in 99 and then you have like another demo and a couple splits one with cold's life uh in in 2001 um and then you get to this record there is like miles difference vocally production wise obviously uh there's some stuff uh rhythmically that i noticed on you know the first record that kind of ends up as well just maybe some of like the uh the right hand kind of like patterning like how how the uh, riff is written but it's just what what 10 years makes in in musical quality is is pretty uh, awesome Uh, yeah this record uh really surprised me in that way you know i think i've listened to that first record maybe twice Mm -hmm. um you know, after two listens, I can generally kind of get the consensus of it. If like it's my thing or not, I almost treated that as like, here's a demo um, or here's an entirely separate band. You know, it's an entirely different band. Yeah, there's aspects of it that went on to go on to birth is pain. But I I foresee this band being what this band is around that birth is pain era. And they just kind of went up from there. Um, so any of like the splits demos and stuff they released right before the birth is pain album. Uh, came out that's a little bit more adjacent to where I think ringworm became ringworm um you know it's that first one just kind of sounds like a hardcore record to me yeah. uh, I think you you touched on it there's some very youth of today kind of esque vocal patterns or vocal parts on yeah. there yeah he kind of sounds like he's doing you know uh Ray Capo type of like vocal style to me like it, it maybe you know again you're trying to and I don't know if this is true or not maybe I'm projecting a little bit but the the approach it kind of sounds like that to me and you know the inflection and everything um this is where i think he certainly comes in on his own it's like deeper it's you know i don't know if it's age or just life you know (laughs) bearing down on a person what's the crowbar tweet that's been going out recently oh uh you can't you you know something along the lines of you have to have like a couple decades worth of pain and sorrow for you can understand a crowbar record yeah and that maybe that's all it takes is like 10 years to just really kind of like a diamond being like really just under yep. pressure just to form birth is pain. Um, we kind of mentioned this is their first album for victory and mm-hmm. yeah, it's kind of a, an interesting time for the label. You know, this is yep. a Chicago based hardcore label, Tony Brummel, who has uh, seen many a controversy in his mm-hmm. time as a label owner uh, in the scene. Um, you know, a label that, perhaps was kind of known for signing hardcore bands. Everybody was like all about this label. You had like earth crisis and hate breed and, uh, you know, integrity. Um, now you kind of, all of these bands have kind of gone off and done their own thing. And now you have kind of what you mentioned earlier, bands like a you, uh, taking back Sunday, Thursday are being signed. So ringworm coming in to this label are kind of like the outlier. They're like kind of the lone, uh, you know, members of like a gar that you know they probably came a little too late and they always kind of mentioned yeah we were very clearly clearly out of place we didn't feel at home at this label but they would go on to release uh several releases through victory uh during the next few years yeah i you know victory victory records was great for a lot of people in the mid to late 90s into the early 2000s right they were putting out a lot of seminal hardcore records uh, they were signing primarily hardcore bands, uh, but I think what you saw is some of those bands started to generate label interest, like big label interest. I mean, Hatebreed signed to Warner Brothers mm. or something like that, like a massive label. Um, and I'm sure that's where uh, you started to see kind of the cycle of what was going on in metal hardcore change. Uh, that's when you did get those those kind of early metalcore bands and um, those kind of you know more accessible bands. Um, being signed to that label because as a label, I assume that it's a certain point you got to see what's going to generate income uh, for that label. And, you know, it was a changing period of time for a lot of bands. I mean, in 01, when it comes to metal and hardcore, when it comes to hardcore in particular, I guess the big quintessential album that came out in 01 was Jane Doe. Mm. And that was put out through Equal Vision Records. Um, I mean, that's a big, that's a big album to ever have the follow up and obviously ringworm sounds nothing like converge in the least bit and you you could see times were changing when it came to like you know 
melodic aspects of hardcore, uh, anything like that. And Ringworm have a little bit more in common with, say, A Coldest Life, A Marauder, Hatebreed, um, All Out War, and Integrity. They have a little bit more in common with that. And you could even say that, you know, we go back to they're too metal for the hardcore kids, too hardcore for the metal kids. Um, I've always considered Ringworm a metalcore band in a sense because it's metal and hardcore blending. But I guess you could really get down to like brass tacks and it's a metallic hardcore band or anything like that. Um, but being on that label, you know, it, it it was a great thing because they did get wider recognition from that label, but they may not have gotten the focus that they deserved because how do you market that band when you're marketing bands to like Hot Topic, MTV, uh, Fuse, Uranium, all of those different kind of facets for heavy music at that time. Uh, this was also during like new metals peak, right? This is like, Oh one, how do you market this band? Um, you know, how do you push it? Yeah. You've got a band that's going to consistently put out great or just cool records, hard records, you know, every time, every release. Um, but how do you market it? You know, uh, victory is controversial, always will be, doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but has a vast catalog of this. And a lot of people stopped listening probably around this time to this record label um, and just went forward. But I arguably, I think it was a good step for this band at the time to be on such a seminal hardcore label. And even, even for the band signing, and I would assume they signed in like 2000. Um, if this album came out in 01, you still weren't going to see what was going to happen with the label till much later. I'm kind of surprised. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of times in music bands will get like, caught up in label stuff or be on a label that they don't really appreciate. And sometimes those bands will just like put out albums. They don't care about right. to yeah. uh, just fulfill the contract. I'm kind of surprised that ringworm didn't just do that when they realized what this situation with victory was going to be. I'm surprised they weren't just like, well, let's right. write really boring hardcore records for four albums and then go over to wherever. That's a good point because you'll hear stories like that for sure. Mm -hmm. Like Deicide, basically, I, I heard yep. this came up recently where I was listening to a podcast or something where just push out a record just to fulfill that uh, yep. contractual agreement. Uh, but yeah, the, the quality hit them album. The quality never really uh, faltered with Ringworm. I feel like they've only since gotten better. And then yeah, where I where I jumped in, it Relapse. I think you know that era of the band. And even now with the, the newest uh, record for Nuclear Blast, mm -hmm. which people should definitely check out, I just feel like it's what I associate with that band more versus maybe even a record like this one. But, yeah, um, you know, let's maybe go through the lineup a little bit. See who's on this record. Matt Sorg on guitars, Aaron Ramirez on bass, uh, Chris Dora, drums formerly of Integrity. Uh, you have uh, Frank Three Gun uh, on yeah. guitar. And then, of course, currently in hate breed, currently in hate breed. And now, of course, you have a really just kind of uh, the signature vocal stylings of yep. uh, one James Human Furnace uh, Block. Is it Blotch? Sounds about right. Yeah, sure. Hey, Human Furnace. Black. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, what a I mean, I touched on this earlier, but what like a what a vocal performance. Uh, I'm sure he's not doing any sort of like vocal acrobatics, but. He is recognizable to a point that uh, many years later, he was asked to guess on a uh, Acacia Strain record. Yeah. And uh, Continent, matter of fact, a uh, big record for them. And he gets to the studio and I think like they just paid him in like a, a fifth of whiskey and some beer or something like that. And they brought him in and he's like, hey, hey, guys, like I can, you know, I can do multiple takes. He did one take and they were all just like, that's perfect. That's what we wanted. <laughs> And yeah, he's, like, Cleveland. Can, he's like, I can do more. They're like, no, 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 this is perfect. This is exactly what we wanted. So he's on like, you know, it shows that like what he was doing was impactful. And it just, he sounds hard on these records. Uh, and he sounds the same every record. What? What, what, what are you going to say? Nothing. He's just very, uh -huh. this man is hard as hell. <laughs> yep. Uh, sure he is. Bricked uh, up. He, he did an interview <laughs> with I, I think the lamb goat podcast this year where he was like uh after the new record came out where he was like yeah uh ringworm vocals like i only have like 
I don't have that many tools in my chest for a ringworm. Like <laughs> I ain't sing, I ain't singing. Uh, and there's not going to be any ballads. There's not going to be any love songs. So, like this is what ringworm vocals sound like. This is what they will always sound like. So I, I, I like the love song thing because there's a quote on ringworm in general. He's like all breakup songs. They're all love songs. He's like, eh, it's a breakup song. They're all love songs. <laughs> Yeah, he was like, I don't know why people like beating people up in our in our pit so much. All these songs are breakup songs, idiots. <laughs> He's hardcore Kirk Winstein. Oh my god, it's same in stature. Nah, I'm gonna cut that out. You're gonna, uh, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut that out. Hey, there's that Vinny Stigma quote of what they called him. Oh yeah, little yeah, Undertaker. little Undertaker. Oh, little Undertaker. <laughs> really? Did they play with yeah. uh, Agnostic Front? Oh, I'm sure. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they went on tour with AF. Nice. Um, I mean, from the opening track, The Sickness, uh, Oof, you really do ooh, right kind of get a feel for the rest of the record. I mean, we've kind of touched on it with previous episodes we've done together, but, you know, this definitely sets the pace. You know, that that gap in time, you are really just kind of taken into, like, a new era of the band uh, from, you know, just the tighter production, uh, yeah. you know, performance wise, like the vocals clearly have elevated themselves since, uh, doing that first record. Uh, it, it's a great opening track for a record. Just those right out the gate the just, I can hear the drums in my head. I can hear the guitar synced up with the drums. Like it's great. Cause like, there's a great blending of these big moshable kind of like kind of metal, riffs all over it mixed in with like traditional hardcore like chord progressions and all of that you know it's it's not necessarily just a riff fest which you know we like but when it comes to like the metal and hardcore thing there has to be a good blending of both of those because if it's too riff centric it's more metallic and if it's you know too chord progressive um you know reminiscent it is more of a hardcore thing at least in in my head uh and what you get in here is like a massive like combination of all of that i mean this first track definitely has like some slayer vibes to it uh definitely has some like early 90s death metal vibes to it which are all over this record um but it is it is a tight track he's angry from the get-go um it's like 25 minutes of just a man mad at god and it's (laughs) it's so perfect um you know there's some rhythmic choices on this song that were definitely reminiscent of the promise definitely with the right hand and the rhythms of it. Um, but the production is better. Uh, the vocals sound better, uh, the whole nine. I mean, a good song out the gate for your first kind of big indie debut. Right. Uh, and that kicks into right into take back what's ours. And that's like a sepultura riff. I, I heard. Yeah. I hear that. I hear like Slayer. I hear just, very kind of more, you know, kind of more classic, uh, yeah. heavy metal riffing uh, that may have been like popular uh, like five, 10 years prior to this record coming out. Yeah, absolutely. There's some, um, this is the first instance on this record, I believe, of him doing his layered vocals, which is a, a kind of a, a key uh, ringworm thing. He layers those vocals and it gives you that kind of, dem- that demonic kind of presence sound. Uh, and obviously there's a horror tie in with this band as well. He's, you know, I would assume that he's probably the big horror fan of the group. All of them are. I mean, they're named after a Vincent Price movie. Um, there's a Vincent Price quote or a sample on the album. That's right. Uh, Madison. Oh, Four. there's two. Oh, there's two. Yeah. Uh, the last song, uh, oh, that's right. Right. that has a sample too. That's yeah. right. Do you, I know the one from uh, Madness of Wars uh, from the House of Usher that Roger Corman, uh, Vincent Price. Yeah. Like, what, what do you remember what the last one is? I don't know. If- uh, I, I would assume it's the same, but I yeah. don't know hey, for sure. It's if it's Vinny Price in there, that's all that's all I'm worried yeah. about. Um, the next track, which is the title track. I mean, it starts with just a mosh call riff. It starts with like the pit is getting ready to start. Dude, a lot of these songs like, you know, sometimes bands i feel like you the your first instinct is to kind of like build up to the breakdown a lot of songs on this record just start with a breakdown part (laughs) i mean it is it is dyed in the wool like hardcore by numbers and i don't mean that in a negative way at all it's like oh yeah we're here to play like two and a half minute long songs that you know get a rise out of everybody 
And, you know, you look back at some of their interviews, their more recent interviews where they're talking about like, yeah, we're a little bit more metal than the hardcore crowd. It's like with this record, not necessarily like it's this right. If this record came out four years ago, uh, well, five years ago, um, this would have fit right in with what was going on in hardcore at that point. Like, absolutely Uh, would. I want ringworm playing panic chord fucking hardcore is what I want. So (laughs) I there's I got a tie into that here in uh, one of the later tracks. I think the like last few lines of this song are like the angriest that human furnace sounds in the whole album, which is a weird thing to say, but it's yeah. like release your rage out to the world. I is was just the, like, <laughs> there's the, the part of the song where it's like, he's literally just going, Gah! like almost like with the fucking double bass going, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's like almost great. like timed up. Right. And I was like, this is so intense. It's yeah, it's yeah. A, the good title track. Yeah. And then, then we lead into the, the first Vincent price sample. Right? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, uh, Madness of War. Good, good song. Um, again, some more like double bass on this track for mm-hmm. sure. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me about this band in particular is uh, the solos. This, this, yeah. this song has a solo on it, which I, my, my first impression is like, oh man, that's awesome. It's killer. But then I also go back to me on that harm's way tour, like watching all of these kids yeah. just like, boo. It's just, boo. <laughs> And I'm like, come on, this is like, it's Ringworm. Like, it's it's an yeah. awesome, awesome uh, song Get in particular. Get stoked, you nerds. <laughs> Get stoked. Deal with it. Um, this track is just big, beefed up, like, uh, chord progressions all over it. Uh, there's that great point where there's, like, blasting and tremolo parts, which is, like, very, like, old school death metal, very, like, kind of Swedish-influenced death metal even. Um, I mean, there it's just a thrashing big gnarly track with a fucking two-step at the end (laughs) yeah yeah like just a great great two-step at the end of this song um as as i'm sure we've all known like he's kind of bit of a he's kind of a poet when it comes to like lyricism and some of his song titles and we get right into the first one that is like amputee (laughs) i mean another another uh breakdown intro just really yeah, bold just, a, just bam, kicks in with the snare and like it, it's there um just chord progressions these big doomy chords again like that's why you know yeah it makes sense that these guys were probably listening to like early sabbath records and, and all of that like old school metal records i'm sure there's like some new wave of british heavy metal stuff going on there matter of fact i think um uh, austin when you and i saw them the first time together uh, I believe one of the guys was in, was uh, sound checking with a fast way riff. Oh, he definitely was. Absolutely. He was doing say what you uh, say you will. Uh, yeah, that was so fun. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yes, they were definitely. Um, yeah, that fast Eddie Clark post Motorhead band. Um, I want to say that was in Louisville. Yeah, but that, I think that, the venue's not around anymore. Diamonds is it? Diamond uh, Swindle is oh. it? They may have opened back up in a different spot. I don't remember. Gotcha. If we remember our uh, crowbar episode, that was the uh, that was the show we went to after my twenty first birthday. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the the show that you guys took me on my twenty first birthday. But I was uh, I was driving weird. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, almost. This is that's a twenty four pack of Keystone Light. <laughs> that and made then it. we got back and drank more. It made up for all those times I drove you around, Austin. That's that's fair. All right, hey, we don't have to <laughs> we don't have to do that on, on my podcast. All right, no. <laughs> I can so, end this Zoom meeting real quick. Turn this goddamn <laughs> Zoom meeting around, man. The the way you just said goddamn there, man, you definitely spent some time in the south. Yeah, that is, well, that is, it's there. It's all don't, your fault. Don't act like it's not there. It's both of y'all's fault. Um, so then we kick into, you know, the beginning of the, the second half of the record, right? So like the B side, uh, with probably the, I would say the most known track on the record, uh, another great title, uh, dollar whore. Um, (laughs) this has, this song has a great line that stuck out to me. Your body was thrown into a ditch. Um, I heard that and was like, all right, this is where we're going. This kind (laughs) of ties in with the whole love song thing. Uh, if any of the tracks on the record sound like current era ringworm, it's this one. Yeah. Uh, this has all the different, you know, 
uh, ingredients that would make the ringworm stew that we're used to and by today's standards. Nice little food reference there for you, uh, bud. Swindle is a, uh, what kind of stew is ringworm? What kind of, what kind of stew is it? Something like, uh, we'll go with like a fish, a fish soup of some kind, but they yep. just okay. sat out, uh, all just day. got linguine noodles in it. It's just, it's got, it's got heavy cream in it, but it's just been oh, sitting yeah. in like the oh, Kentucky July sun. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the soup. That's the soup you pour over the overpass, right? <laughs> yeah. <Forever. laughs> Is that, a, is that a thing you used to do? Is you hope nothing in, <laughs> incriminating? Just, hey, just take I a chamber the, pot out to I sixty five and pour. When soup. when I was a kid yeah. and I saw the Simpsons episode where Bart and Millhouse were squirting the ketchup and the mustard over the overpass, uh, I'm not going to say that I didn't take that and internalize it. And in my teen years, we didn't put stuff over overpasses. I'm not going to say that we didn't. Um, so moving on, uh, we're on to the next track, which is self destruct. Uh, opens up with an obituary riff. Um, yeah, it just it just sounds like an obituary riff that is slightly sped up. Um, you know, Human Furnace really sticks out on this track to me, big time. Um, again, with those great layered vocals, there's also some really weird bass stuff going on mm. on this song, uh, as well as some of the other songs on the record. Like there's there's some really odd bass centric stuff that you're hearing underneath. Like there's one solo in particular that you hear the bass playing these like almost Rex Brown-esque lines under it. Um, and I mean, it's again, just a big bass break at the end of the song that sets up another great hardcore breakdown. I don't know if we kind of even touched on it with like our, our cattle episodes where I feel like it, this, this record is kind of unrelenting and just kind of builds and builds and like, I don't know. It's, it's uh, sequenced very well. I don't know how much yes. thought is into that, but it, it works like I feel like every song is exactly where it needs to be. It, it it paces the album quite nicely. This band like Integrity had some they in their '90s albums. They have like some songs that were would be like slower or just like more quiet. Uh, right. This is not Ringworm. We're like we ain't doing we ain't doing none of that baby shit. Like we're. <laughs> We're writing a fucking hardcore. We're writing a metal album. God damn it. From Cleveland. We're Browns fans. All right. And we're mad about I would, it. We're <laughs> mad as hell. I would hedge a bet with these guys growing up listening to like old school classic rock records that there was probably an inkling of, okay, um, the sequencing needs to be well. It's obviously a very short record. It's 25 minutes. Uh, the sequencing needs to go well. And each song should probably feed into the next one a little bit, which are, it's very reminiscent of some really classic records. Uh, even the way the the album begins really hard and it ends with like a very melodic track, which is um, I, I've got some detailed notes on that one because it just ends so well. Uh, but, you know, just to just to go over these last um, couple tracks we've got here, uh, Endless Cycles is as close to a death metal song as this band could have written during this period. Uh, it's got these great tremolo kind of parts throughout with blast beats. Another great vocal line in that is your words don't mean fucking shit. Um, I mean, just again, just you got, you got to have shit like that. Um, and then we go into again and again, which is one of my favorite tracks on the album. Um, uh, again, hook. he's at the hook. Yeah. He's pissed. Um, that's that song and kind of self-destruct are like two songs with like a chorus or yeah. like a hook. Um, this has, this song also has the, I'm not very drum centric when I speak, but this has the criminally insane drum pattern underneath some parts, which is fucking great. Um, and again, adds, adds some like old school elements of Slayer in there. Kind of that early era Slayer, like rain and blood, haunting the chapel, show no mercy, that sort of thing. Um, and it is, it's just a great thrash track. I mean, there's blasting in it. These guys know what intensity is and it did absolutely doesn't let up. Now this last track, which is, I can see, um, I love this track. It's there's samples constantly playing under it. There's also vocals in there from, I believe it is uh, Dan Johnson from the band unholy. Yeah. Um, there's some great stuff in there, but this track sounds like dismember. This track sounds like my dying bride. Uh, these guys were definitely keeping an, I, an ear to the underground as well and probably were listening to more than just 
you know, hardcore records. They were probably listening to early era death metal, death new, death doom. Uh, there was probably some black metal being listened to at this time. Uh, I'm sure these guys got hammered many a night at practice and just sat down and watched old fucking hammer. Look for the, films. look I, for the Coors Light cans. That's all I can uh, Coors Light. If it's Cleveland, it's probably hams, right? Yeah, I, that, I think that's yeah. right. Maybe it's probably hams. Um, and then I don't know what sample ends this song with the woman screaming. That is terrifying. This would be a record I would hand to anybody that would say like, Hey, I'm, you know, I like hardcore. You know, I've been listening to, the, you know, maybe more modern bands, whatever it is. This is an album I would hand to people and go like, Hey, you're going to love this. This is like the motorhead of hardcore because you know what you're getting. That, right? That's a it's good way to put it. Solid, so. solid shit. Re- uh, I almost called him ringworm, but human furnace, <laughs> yeah. human furnace said that exactly. Uh, in one of the interviews I watched or read, he was like, literally, he said, like Motorhead, word for word. He was like, just like Motorhead, uh, you know what you're going to get when you get a ringworm album. And that, you know, sometimes that's like exactly what I want. Like, there are bands where I'd be like, okay, yeah, I expect like something wacky or like experimentation Mm -hmm. with ringworm and like, crowbar and bands like i high on fire i find comfort in like just progressing the thing that they're like most known yeah. for that sound equality like and you know i think honestly motorhead probably does like span all three of those bands very clearly i mean i think yeah dylan you were the one who's like recommended high on fire under the tagline it's like motorhead on meth and yeah. that certainly is fitting. Absolutely. Yeah, that sticks fitting, to it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I I am not upset that this band basically is just doing what they do at the top of their game still. Like, you hear the most recent record. It's just as good as this record. Oh, it's that's such a core cool record, mm-hmm. too. Uh, you know, for anybody that is listening and wants to hear that record, it just came out, I believe, a few months ago. Um Definitely check that record out. Uh, Seeing um, through fire, it is out of uh, nuclear blast. Yeah, their first one for nuclear blast, I believe. It's correct. Um, so, uh, yeah, that is a fun record. It's got like eleven tracks. It's like again, kind of like this. It's not, thirty-two minutes or something. Yeah, it's pretty damn close. So, pretty easy listen. But all of the songs that I've I've kind of circled through it a little bit by this time, but it's it's just as good as this record or any record they've done. Solid band. Solid band. Uh, I I truly believe they will always be tied to integrity because of the Cleveland tie-in. Mm-hmm. Albeit yeah. these bands these bands sound completely different for one another. Um, I, I honestly would say that I can trust the Ringworm catalog quite a bit more than I can the Integrity catalog. Um, you know, Integrity's got, in my opinion, probably two or three really good records. Uh, whereas Ringworm. You can listen to the whole catalog and go, okay, I'm, I'm feeling this album today. I'm feeling this album today. I mean, their relapse output, unstoppable. I mean, from the first EP Bleed when they did that in like 2013, like up until uh, the last record that came out in, I believe, 2019. Yeah. Um, you know, those are all great. And then you got, again, you got Ringworm four years later um, on Nuclear Blast. So this band is spanning, what, almost 30 years, if not just right over 30 years. Like 35 and touring hard, always a band yes. that is just constantly, constantly touring. They just played the Cobra in Nashville, a, a, like last week, right? So, yeah, it's pretty insane. You know, I feel like bands like that, you'd get worn out or you'd burn out on a, on a tour regimen and recording regimen. And obviously, all of these guys like do their own thing still, you know, uh, maybe they have professions that allow for them to kind of travel around a little bit but um you'd 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 think that oh you know you you age you'd want to maybe be a little bit more like oh i got i got my sandwich shop in cleveland i like you know going to the park no i'm just gonna be on tour forever (laughs) that's the light they're truly truly lifers um i guess do we have any closing thoughts on this record why why this record over others like you know obviously we talked about you really could have picked any record out of their discography for the most part and, and been fine. But why this record in particular? Uh, well, I suggested this record because it was the first uh, ringworm 
record I listened to. It's probably the first uh, Ringworm record that sounds like Ringworm. Yeah. And yes. it, without like trying to be too uh, like without trying to act like I know music too much like it's probably the first good ringworm record also personally i don't really like the first one uh but like all of the like we said all their albums after this are just as good if not better like they probably are doing a better job of sounding like ringworm now than they did on this album birth is pain yeah they found they definitely found their sound um, I would say that this is just the, this is the first full length record I heard from the band. This was my kind of gateway into this band and then going on and hearing, you know, the relapse output with, uh, this out, al- this is, this is the album that set me up to love this band, uh, hearing this album, then hearing hammer of the witch, not terribly long after really, uh, hearing the bleed EP and before that, and then going back and looking at the victory output, this is the record that really really made me understand that like, oh, hardcore isn't just this sound. It can be a multitude of things. It can, you know, you know, hit across the whole spectrum of what, you know, this type of music could be. And it definitely solidified this band as a, oh, I'm always going to check out anything this band releases now. Like this is always going to show up in their queue. I can imagine not having heard this record and seeing them play this live for you like yeah. when they get into that first riff from the first oh, song yeah. and the double bass, like you were just like, okay, yeah. Like I'm going to listen to this when I get home. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was, it was one of the loudest, it was one of the loudest bands I've ever seen between, uh, I, I saw black breath, not terribly long before this. And I, again, took my head off. It was like the way the guitars were mixed. They played that converge show we went to. That's right. That's right. Uh, rip Obi's pizza. Um, oh man. But see, you're right. Seeing this band live playing this record, hearing that opening track. And, you know, I don't really remember much about that, about what took place at that show, like how the crowd reacted in that sense. Um, but I know there's some like tour vlogs from that tour that are that are out. And like um, the crowd is kind of eh, hit or miss because this is a band that kind of flew under the radar for so long. Where did that show end up being after it was? Was it at the Muse? Uh, it was at Exit Inn. Oh, okay. It was at Exit Inn. It would be fitting if it were at the Muse. I drove by that Domino's last night. Yeah. Did you get did you yeah. get flashbacks? <laughs> I did. I was like in a car with like three other people uh, who, well, one of them was Will. So he knew what the Muse right. was, but the other two people were like, what are you talking about? That's a Domino's, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I, I, I once saw bullet holes in the side of that bathroom. <laughs> Oh yeah, Ring, Ringworm would happily play that venue. Had it yep. still, they would still play that Dominoes right now if you if you asked them. I think, but yeah, great record. Um, I I was more familiar with their later stuff as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. So to kind of come back and see really where it all began in a lot of ways is uh, really really cool. It gives you a lot of context. But again, pick pick a pick a record from any era or any year of this band. Uh, you're you're not going to be disappointed i think so definitely birth is pain great great beginning yep. for a long and uh just wonderful history so uh now's the time that we typically talk about what we've been listening to throughout the week uh so what i have for us today is uh alluvial the band featuring guitar player wes hawk hawk i can't really pronounce his last name well, has released an EP called uh, Death is But a Door that has some really great groovy death metal songs on it with really stellar guitar playing. That guy is uh, one of those unfuck withable guitar players uh, in vain with like a Dave Davidson, um, a Dimebag Daryl, even to that. Um, great, great EP, has some of their best tracks I've heard from the band. Uh, they've got a great... Uh, t-shirt that I bought when I saw them that is the uh, Pazuzu print from um, uh, The Exorcist. Just that one scene, it's just got their name on it. It's a great shirt. Uh, So check that out. Um, And then we've got, uh, I want to bring this up, and I don't know if you're going to touch on this, Austin, um, but the Portugal The Man single that just released with like Mismore. I wasn't 
but I uh, I loved listening to it. It was such a wild kind of drop, and it has a video with it. Correct, he's like donning yeah. corpse paint and the whole nine. Uh, awesome, I love it. That is that is some out of pocket stuff. Uh, I've never listened to Portugal the Man ever, but hearing that was like I got to check this out. This is just too interesting not to be fun. I was gonna say if there was if there is one person, I would have never thought would have suggested Portugal the man, it would have been you, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, you know, there's that one Mountain Goats record that I'll listen to because Eric Rutan helped produce something on it. Like, best little death metal band in... Uh, uh, Denton. Denton, okay, yeah. that's it. Uh, the uh, the only time I... I think I've seen Portugal the man and it was because they played... Uh, do you guys remember Starry Nights? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the yeah. old festival at the dirt, uh, the dirt bike track. I think they play there. And uh, yeah, that's my only uh, real sort of association with that band. But yeah, it was a it was an interesting choice. I love when bands take a cover and just like flip it on its head and do a thing. Well, Swindle and I talked about this previously where um, I know I recommended a uh, there's a Neil Young cover, the needle and the damage done that Cloud Rat did. That's Mm -hmm. amazing. Swindle, you sent me one by uh, 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 there's a thou tie in. Change, Change the to the bottom. bottom. They did a uh, Death Cab for Cutie cover. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, good Come band. Uh, Chain to the I, Bottom of the Ocean has a new record out too that people should check out. But yeah, this is a, a that's a cool cover, Dylan. I, I really like it. Um, and then the the last thing I have is a uh, it's a band called hopefully I pronounce this right called Disgustabus. Uh, they released an EP called Body Horror. It is five songs, and each song is based off of a body horror film from the 80s. Uh, I don't know which song. I'm still in the midst of figuring that out. But uh, one of the members of this band plays in a very brutal death metal band from Germany called Putridity. And uh, I saw somebody had linked this. I went, all right, I got to check this out. I'm sure it's just kind of hyper-technical, like kind of brutal death metal. And it's it's fun minutes or fun listen. It's 14 minutes long. Um, that's all I've got. I don't know what time of the year this came out, but uh, there is a guy named Will Killingsworth who played guitar in Ampere and Orchid, not the not the black metal Orchid, but like the Screamo Orchid. Uh, and he was in a power of violence band called Vaccine. But since like none of his music is really on any streaming platform every few years, I'll just like Google search him and see what music he's released. But uh, this year he he's in a band called Longings, which released an album called Dreams in Red, uh, and it's kind of like post punk, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe a little like uh, Franken Christ era Dead Kennedys, uh, and it's good and it's really weird for his normal type of playing, but also in uh, looking at his other shit. There's another power violence band that he's in called No Faith with the album called Forced Subservience. Um, it's kind of long for a power violence record. It's like 28 minutes long. Damn. And there are songs that that are like just digital noise with people screaming over. So it's kind of hard to listen to, uh, but it's power violence. So what yeah. power violence album isn't hard to listen to. Um, and we talked about it on the last episode, but We've been watching horror movies every day, and uh, the other horror wreck that I have is the 1979 When a Stranger Calls. Mm, mm. I had never seen it, but I loved it, uh, and I didn't realize that the whole like opening sequence of the first Scream movie is a reference to When a Stranger Calls. Uh, the phone, the phone call right. scene. Ha- kind of happens in when a stranger calls a guy keeps calling her and is like have you checked on the children uh yeah that, that movie uh was actually uh something i saw for the first time this year too and i, I when i saw it i thought um carol kane would be in a little uh, be in it a little more but uh there's like a little bit of a gap but it's uh definitely effective uh good good horror flick for this season uh speaking of will killingsworth and at dead air studios uh my next rec actually has some production work of Will's on it. It is the debut stomach record, Parasite. Uh, Chicago land, what Chicago suburb uh, locals, John Hoffman, Adam Tomlinson, 
Uh, John Hoffman, of course, former member of uh, Weekend Nachos, Harm's Way, Ledge. Uh, Adam uh, was in a couple bands called Sick Tired and Sea of Shit. Uh, they are in uh, this kind of doom sludge duo known as Stomach, and they just released their debut full-length record through Hibernation Release. Uh, it is pummeling. It is bleak in uh, ways that I think differ from Weekend Nachos and Ledge. If you haven't checked it out, uh, it's got like eight songs. This uh, features some slow tracks that you love, uh, some kind of fast power violence parts as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, you know, uh, John is a, a friend. We've had him on our live show, Vocal Distortion, several times, kind of playing some music. And uh, this is a, a great, great uh, first debut record for this two piece. Um, we'll be back next week talking about riffs, talking about records for Austin, who is me, Dylan, who's there, and Swindle, who's also here. Uh, you've been listening to Riff Worship. You can always follow us for updates on this show as well as our live show, Vocal Distortion at Distortion 891. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>